Well, welcome back to the uh, Care Ministry Podcast. This is episode 60. This is for November of uh, 2021. And again, our go-to scripture is Romans 12 to change your mind, change your life. And as we dive in today, we actually had a question from one of our listeners, and we want to kind of recap and come back to uh, a discussion we had on episode 55 from September 30th. But before we do, we're going to talk about um, Halloween. Uh, a couple <laughs> nights ago, uh, everybody did uh, trick-or-treating, and yeah. Yeah. Well, we had the honor here. of having Tommy's family come and trick-or-treat with us around the neighborhood, so we thought it would be kind of fun to talk about maybe something funny that happened that night or a highlight of walking around the neighborhood There was neighborhood a lot together. of funny stuff, yeah. <laughs> what do you got, Tommy? What do you got? Uh, yeah, so, uh, well, we'll get to uh, to Doc and Marty in a second, but <laughs> uh, no, we, we it was really cool because uh, the last person that you'd ever expect to get candy on Halloween night is a dog <laughs> and one of Tom's neighbors was like hey would your dog like some ice cream we're like yeah sure and I, I don't know the lady's name she's listening I uh, just want to say thank you for the yeah. small cup of Ben and Jerry's puppy ice cream that I mean, <laughs> our dog really enjoyed it so and what flavor was that Tommy I think it was uh, we were joking about like liverwurst and something other but I think it was like peanut butter and pretzels or something sounds good it does yeah i'm sure it tastes <laughs> I did horrible not, i did not try it no not at all. yeah <laughs> uh for me we have one neighbor uh who will remain nameless that every year goes all out with um spooky things in the yard we'll just put it that way and one of the funny moments for me because there's some scary stuff there is we're approaching and tommy's dog just froze and started barking. And my comment was, maybe the dog is the only smart one among us. In oh, yeah, yeah. He was frozen. I mean, there's tracks. all these animatronic zombies and just crazy <laughs> stuff. It, you don't know who's a person in a costume. And so that was a standout moment for me. Like, okay, hold on a minute. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I remember the dog just like, he just froze. <laughs> um, but I, I will say one of the coolest costumes, though, had to be... Uh, 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 Doc Brown and Marty McFly. So, <laughs> for the for the record, I had the cheapest Doc Brown costume. I, I had dish. But it was glo- awesome. I had dish gloves, a painter's. Uh, you know um, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, like a like overalls. A, yeah, yeah. Coveralls and um, an old Luke Skywalker wig that we made into a Doc Brown wig. But it was cool. It, it was, was fun. Awesome. It was fun. Unfortunately, and, we don't have photos. And my but... son, my son uh, was Marty McFly, and he loved every minute of it. So yeah, it was cool. Micah was Paul Blart Mall Cop. That was great. so. Uh, he it, it worked for a little bit, but then I think he got kind of tired of it. He <laughs> just he got more interested in getting more candies. So. I love how kids do that. They start out with the full costume, and then oh, yeah. the later the night goes, the less pieces of the costume are mm-hmm. left on. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think Sam Hancock's daughter. I think there was something with her. They post on social media. She had a hard time getting around, so they had to like change her costume like during the <laughs> middle of it or something. So, but uh, but as we dive in though, um, as we mentioned before, we had a uh, a follow up question from one of our previous episodes, episode fifty five, from uh, some from September thirtieth. And so we just kind of wanted to talk about that. And so the question was, um, well, basically we were talking about different types of addictions. And the question was, how do you apply many of these ideas and teachings to the LGBT LGBT people? Most LGBT people don't have the perfect societal religious path. And so while we, we, we got the question, we're not really sure fully what is being asked. But I, I think we're, what, what the question is, how do you apply some of the things we talk to with with just individuals in general, not just LGBTQ, yeah. but but folks in general who don't accept Christ. As well, and it's that. interesting. That's probably the third or fourth time we've read the question and discussed it today. But as you were reading it just now, what really stood out to me was that last part, I think you said, that doesn't have the perfect social, you know, societal, societal path. Religious and I, path, And I'm yeah. thinking the reality is the majority of people, especially the folks that we come into contact with in the care community, I don't know if there's a perfect societal path. Yeah. Um, and, and that's good because what that shows is that God meets us where we're at. Mm-hmm. So uh, maybe what the person meant is that, hey, a lot of people um, in churches have the benefit of growing up in a Christian home. Their parents introduce the mm-hmm. faith to them. They follow the faith through their life. And that may be true. I don't know if that's true for a majority of Christians anymore or not. Yeah. Um, and that is great, and that's great when that can happen. But... Uh, the first thing I would just say is that everybody has 
a testimony. And that testimony is how um, you came to know Christ as your Lord and Savior, and your testimony is going to reach people and help people that nobody else's testimony is going to. Mm -hmm. And that's what's so cool about how God works in and through the lives of his children. Yep. Well, and, you know, the other thing, too, is that, and, and we'll definitely unpack, like, how can we do this? Like, you know, how do we how do we reach people who, because uh, when he talked about that last part, I, I think I think that I think you're absolutely right. We need to emphasize that last part. And it says, you know, people who don't have the perfect societal religious path. And so I think it's important to talk about how do we how do we do that? How can we how can we implement that? And how can we practice that without seeming like we're uh, browbeating them with the mm. Bible? Yeah, uh, we talk a lot at Northside about the balance between truth and grace, mm -hmm. love and grace, um, you know, love and truth, and, and how do we balance that out when um, we have to be true to our faith and true to what Scripture says, and yet God is very adamant about loving our neighbor as ourselves, that, that, that if, if we can love God with all our mind, our mind, heart, soul, and strength and our neighbor as ourselves, we're fulfilling all the law and prophets. And had an opportunity to talk a little bit about that um, couple of evenings ago in, in care night. And the emphasis I have is if you realize what he's saying there, all the writings, it says all the law and prophets. If you realize what he's saying is being summed up in that, how much emphasis he's really putting on that. And so Tommy, I want to ask you to talk about that a little bit S specific to the LGBTQ plus um, community. Yeah. How, how would you approach a person in that community as far as engaging them, having a conversation with them as a Christian? Uh, I think it would be good for people just to hear what you, how you yeah. do that. Well, and so, no, I, that's a great question. And the first thing we have to realize is that church is for everyone, all people. Now, if you're going to hurt yourself or hurt someone else, uh, we have to call 911 because we don't have emergency services here. So, Everyone is welcome unless you're going to hurt yourself or hurt someone else. That's the baseline because Jesus came for every single one of us. Amen. Jesus hanging out with uh, people like uh, like myself and Tom and everybody else who are the afflicted, the sinful people, like Jesus came for everyone. And we can definitely unpack things like Ephesians 2, you know, where it talks about, you know, uh, reconciling uh, everyone with everyone else, uh, the Jews and the Gentiles. But we have to realize that, Jesus came for everybody. And in the religious elite of the day, the Pharisees, they would often insult Jesus for hanging out with people like like you and I. Uh, but but Jesus came for everybody. Yes. And so we have to go, we have to start there. And what does that mean? It means that, that Jesus came for the broken. Like I always tell people, I'm like we are all in the same boat, the USS sinful broken boat. And we are all there. There's Jesus and then there's the rest of us. And so understand that we are all broken people. And so we have to come at it from that baseline before we even start having any conversations about anything. We talked, um, you know, we try to, to have some conversation prior to getting on the podcast yeah. so that we're, we're at least got our, our thoughts uh, straight in front of us. And one of the things we talked about is um, hopefully if, if you've been a Christian for any length of time and you're involved in a local church, then you know that we're to love everybody. Amen. But one of the things we also talked about is, we don't always do a good job of spelling that out for each other. Yeah. You know, what, what does it, what does it look like to love somebody? So if I'm, if I'm talking to someone who um, sexual orientation is homosexual or a transgender or somebody who identifies in the LGBTQ plus community, how do I engage them lovingly? What, what am I really, if I, if I told somebody in my congregation, you're to love that person. Well, they go, well, yeah, no, no, duh, but I, I don't know what that looks like. Maybe you could unpack that a little bit and talk about kind of how you love somebody that you yeah. know is, is in sin of any kind, really. Yeah. But how would you? So, uh, so the example I gave in our, our brief planning session was uh, this morning. I had some, uh, some folks come out to our house. I have absolutely no idea their background. I don't know if they love Jesus. I don't know if they love something else. I don't even know if they even go to church. I don't know if they... I don't know them, but I was so grateful that these utility folks were there. And I came out there, I greeted them. I said, Hey, how y'all doing today? I said, I am so thankful that you're here. Can I get you anything? Can I help you? Like, I mean, it was a genuine concern, you know, like genuine 
yeah. thankfulness and gratefulness. Yeah. So, I mean, we really have to like, you know, we, when we think about what can we do as, as people who are Christians, we have to think about the fruit. We have to think about the, what is it that, how is it, how is God working in and through us by the things that people see and hear from us? And we can't just magically make that happen. We have to be diving into God's word and constantly be looking at Jesus to see how he did that well. And me, so it, so like yeah. that, that, that was an example of what I did this morning. Yeah. And let I let think me, we have to, let me press in on that. Cause I think yeah. that's a great example. And I would, I'm hoping now that this probably isn't the case across the board, but, yeah. but I'm hoping if you identify as a Christian that extending love and grace and, and common courtesy and politeness is going to be the way you greet anybody that you come in contact with. What if it goes beyond that? So help me. Oh yeah. Uh, help Good me question. see, let, let's say um, you engage one of these workers and you happen to say, let's just be specific to you. Hey, I'm, I'm a pastor at a local church. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe you can kind of see even just from their body posture that they're stiffening up. There's a little bit of a kind of a, you know, stepping back from you and, and it comes up that this person identifies as a homosexual. Yeah. Uh, and they say, am I, am I welcome at your church? Uh, how does your church, uh, um, view homosexuality? How Tommy, do we stay true to our faith and yet still engage that person in love? Yeah. I mean, so, so hundred percent, uh, great question. Uh, First of all, we the answer is yes, you are 100% welcome. And if you can't find a seat to sit at, you can sit right next to me at worship. You can hang out with me if you want to go to get some coffee. Like, we can hang out. Like, I mean, so I 100%. As far as, like, how do you engage that and how do we see that? Uh, well, we have to go back to, you know, um, well, first of all, we have to make sure that the, the conversation is safe and secure. Uh, safe and secure meaning that, uh, that they feel safe, that they feel secure, and in, in, uh, that we're not going to put them on blast. We're not going to throw a Bible at somebody. We're not going to do other things. I know Caleb Col- Coltenbach has talked about in his books, Messy Grace, Messy Truth. Uh, we're not going to do any of that stuff. We're, we're going to love people. And, you know, yes, we're going we're gonna to focus on how to love people as graciously as possible, but we also have to land on truth. Let me complicate it one step further, and I know – we just kind of started to touch on this prior to, to coming into the podcast recording. But what if, and, and there are these folks, and, and if you're listening, we love you, and we're glad to call you brother or sister. Amen. But what about the folks that identify as an active um, Christian, as someone who knows and loves Jesus, um, but is um, either a part of a tradition or a belief uh, where they are unapologetic about uh, their homosexuality, their homosexuality, their homosexual lifestyle, um, but identify as Christian. How, how do we how do we navigate that? And I know I'm asking you a really loaded question. Yeah, I don't expect you to have all the answers, <laughs> but maybe just help our listeners begin to approach that concept. Yeah. Uh, so one of the best things you can do is to get into community of other believers. Uh, you know we. We have community, you know, we push community a lot, and uh, and it's so important to have Christ-centered believers in our corner. Um, and so oftentimes when I'm doing an assessment and counseling, I'll say, hey, what is your walk with Christ like? Are, are you studying God's Word? Are you diving into God's Word? Um, you know, yes, no, maybe. Uh, are, you, are you in community? Uh, many times one of the things we're seeing uh, as a, a uh, not want to say, I don't want to say causation, but correlation is, Oftentimes when folks come into counseling, uh, you know, I know Tom and I, were t- we've talked about this before, is that uh, rarely do, does, does somebody come into counseling saying, yes, I'm, I'm diving to God's word, I'm studying, I'm praying, I'm doing all this. And so, like, that that's question number one. Question number two is, like, are you in community? And rarely is that the case also. Mm-hmm. And so uh, it's so important to have people who have uh, a biblical worldview in our corner to help direct us because none of us are exempt you know, none of us are sinless, Correct. Uh, you yeah. know, and so hopefully yeah. we sin less, but none of us are sinless. That's and good. so we need to have people in our corner to help us direct, to help direct us during those seasons. Yeah. You know, the one thing I think about too is, I, and I just want to make sure I'm very, very clear, is that we, regardless of your background, regardless of um, how you identify sexually, re- regardless of, of, of anything, your gender, regardless of your your ethnicity, um, you are loved, you are heard, 
you are seen and you are not alone and we are here to help. That's great. I um, just appreciate you being willing to tackle those difficult situations. We've been talking a lot as a, a staff on various different topics about how important it really is. Uh, if you can't have hard conversations in love at church, where can you do that? Yep. So um, we know that we've just scratched the surface of this. I hope whoever sent their question in that that was helpful. And I feel like the, the, the other side or the other half of the question was specific to addiction because that's what we were talking about that day. And so kind of changing gears a little bit and maybe talking about sharing ad addiction and recovery uh, specifically with anyone who's not a believer. Yeah. Um, we can continue to talk about the LGBTQ plus community, but really when we're talking about applying the concepts of recovery, I think part of that question was how do I talk to somebody who doesn't have a Judeo Christian worldview about the concepts of recovery? Yeah. And, and what I want to say right up front is that, um, one of the first ever, if not the first ever, truly successful recovery program was Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, and that was in the 30s. I believe it was 35. I may have that a year or two off. But it was founded by two Christian men uh, with concepts that came straight out of Scripture. However, that program was very successful very quickly with people from all faith backgrounds, ethnicities, um, socioeconomic status, because the tie that bound everybody together was their willingness to see their powerlessness and to surrender. Mm -hmm. And the focus wasn't initially on their faith. But I also want to share, and we were talking about this again earlier, that if, if a person can surrender, if a person can get to a place to say, I'm powerless, you can quickly get them to a place where they can begin to interact with God. And, and the reason I say that is this, the, the disease of addiction is an addiction based on self-centeredness. And we hear all the time through scripture, Jesus encouraging us to die to self because he knows that that's an affliction. Mm -hmm. And so once a person's able to admit they're powerless over an addiction, they're quickly told, well, that addiction was actually just a symptom of your problem, of your greater issue. Yeah. And that your greater issue is a self-defeating, self-destroying, self-centeredness. Um, and, and I think the quote from the, the text of AA is selfishness, self-centeredness, this we think is the root of our trouble. And the next concept is you can't defeat self with self, that only divine intervention can heal you. So when you're thinking about how do I talk to a non-believer, you, you don't start with, hey, you're going to need God to get sober. You start with, can you admit that you can't get you sober? Mm -hmm. And if a person can get there, I think one of the concepts in Celebrate Recovery that we, we read every week is, know that I'm not God. Well, if yep. a person can say, I can't get myself sober, we're setting them up to be able to say, well, somebody or something has to be able to help you get sober because thousands and thousands of men and women have gotten sober. And if they didn't get themselves sober, then who's doing it? Yeah. Well, the likelihood is it's not a human power because if you couldn't get you sober, how could some other human power get you any more sober than you could get yourself? Mm -hmm. So it has to be a divine power. And that's how we get to having that initial conversation with people. So I just want to say to anybody, if you've got a friend, family, acquaintance who's suffering from addiction and you go, man, I really want to share my faith with them because I know Jesus can get them sober. You're right. <laughs> Jesus can and will get them sober, but we don't lead with the chin, meaning we don't lead yeah. with the thing that's going to push them away. We lead with the thing that's going to pull them in. And if we go, hey, can you admit this has got you beat? Yep. If they can start there, you can get them to a relationship with Jesus. Yeah. Well, I mean, in, in, in the biblical community, we call it sin, you know, and so like things like pride is sin. But, but if we use words like sin, that's like you said, that's going to, start pushing people away, but we can, we can gently press in and say, is this something, is this, is this maybe some pride? Yeah. Well, you know, and, is, and recovery yeah. lingo is character defects. Yeah, there you go. You know, yeah. and, and, um, I'm, I'm the other words eluding me now, but there are a lot of ways to talk about sin, you know, places we've fallen short, places we're powerless, places we struggle. Um, 
uh, you said pride, you know, self-centeredness. We can name some things. We don't have mm-hmm. to call them sin. Yeah. Um, or, or is this, you know, uh, is is your feelings right now or your are your plans driven by your feelings go back to a feeling of envy? Yeah, sure. You know, is there some jealousy sure. there? You know, yeah. so, but yeah, I, I think it's so important to, to make sure that, you know, as Christians, you know, we, we have to understand too that not everybody is, uh, you know, uh, not any particular person, but uh, not everyone accepts Jesus as their Lord and King, but we can still talk about truths that come out of there. So, so like the importance of talking about how, you know, pride can get in our way, you know, I know you talked about pride, so, so, but the, the fact that our pride can get in our way and it can cause damage in our relationships, it can cause damage in our own lives, but just, it's so important to make sure that, that we talk on a, uh, we talk where people are at, whether they accept Jesus or not, using biblical principles. Yeah. How, how do you have those conversations? Like if someone says, you know, hey, I want to, I want to, I, I want to get uh, sober, uh, but I don't believe in this Jesus thing. Yeah. I or, mean, or I, I don't want to be, I, I don't want to have somebody breathe down my neck with about Jesus. Yeah, then no, that's a good question. And and if someone were that direct, it'd be great. Probably yeah. they won't be quite that direct. Yeah. They're probably going to say things like, "I want to get sober aside from God," or "I want to." Uh, you know, I, I want to be sober, but I'm not sure I can, you know, do everything that's necessary. I think, I think kind of back to just, or maybe I don't even like church. Right. You know, yeah. Right. And, yeah. and back to previous comments would be, well, you don't have to worry yourself with that right now. Yeah. You know, if, if, um, if you can, if you can admit that you can't defeat this on your own and you're asking for help, that's a good start. You know, I was really fortunate. Um, I was not an active believer when I got sober, but I was open to whatever was going to help me because I was desperate. Mm-hmm. And so one of the things that is good to, to enter into conversation with people is how willing are you? I understand that you're not wanting to have a relationship with God right now, but are you willing to do whatever it takes to stay sober? Yeah. Are, you, are you saying that I have to be in? Not necessarily, but if you don't have a willingness mm-hmm. and a desire, it's not going to stick, right? So having that conversation about, and then what my first sponsor, my first mentor said directly to me is, Tom, if you can get the concept through your mind right now that you're not in control of your life, in other words, you're not God, you've made a good start, <laughs> right? Yeah. Because mm-hmm. original sin and the sin that we do over and over and over again in our life is trying to take control and be the God of our own lives. Yeah. And that's no different with the recovering person. So if if they can get the concept at some level that they're not God, that they're not in control, and that if they were, this wouldn't be happening in their life, you can you can minister to them later down the road. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are a lot of people that call the 12-step program the back door to God because they never would have set foot in a church, but they came into 12-step recovery, and recovery introduced them to Jesus. Well, I was going to ask that question, too, because I know one of the things you talked about when, when I first came on was I was trying to connect somebody with CR, and we couldn't find a CR, and I was like, yeah, I'm trying to get them to CR, and uh, and you were like, hey, that's okay. If they got to go to AA, that that's fine, too, and you talked about how there was uh, uh, you know healing, and people were able to find recovery in AA. If you could do you mind unpacking that a little bit? I mean, no, because we can easily good. get wrapped up around celebrate recovery versus AA. No, that's really good. So, as a Christian, as a pastor, if I could, um, if we could have CR every single day of the week and cover the recovering community with that, I would do that. That's not reality. Mm-hmm. And so, to your point, if someone needs to get sober and they can't make it to CR, but they can get to some AA meetings, and and I mentioned this earlier. The, all the twelve step concept, the co founders, everything that comes out of it comes out of scripture, comes out of the Bible. Mm-hmm. It is in its in its original form really Christian. And so that that still lives within the program. There are a lot of Christians in AA, a lot mm-hmm. of people who love God, a lot of people who have found victory there. And the other piece is this. I said when I got in recovery, I wasn't following Christ. Mm-hmm. But I had a Christian sponsor who very gently and lovingly started taking me back to church, giving me Christian books to read, praying with me, talking about this gently. So for any of you who are worried to let your loved ones or even yourself go to a quote-unquote secular 12-step program, mm-hmm. you have to know that the the bottom line, um, actually, even in the every reading they do at every meeting of AA says... Um, 
that God is the solution. The yeah. reading says something to the effect of, um, you know, uh, uh, I'm trying to think exactly how it goes, but it basically says that God's the answer. May you find him now. Mm-hmm. You know, there's no, there's no, you hear people say scary things like, oh, people have a doorknob as a higher power. I can tell you the people that have quality sobriety that are helping others know God as their Lord and Savior, mm-hmm. even within those programs. So that's a great question, Tommy. Yeah. You know, and the other thing too is, uh, can you talk a little about, because uh, you kind of touched on a little bit, was how Celebrate Recovery, unfortunately, uh, the there's just not a lot of them around in comparison. But some of the benefits with AA that, that you just don't see, like, you know, the number of classes and how, how they're available. Yeah, I mean, so I think I think if Celebrate Recovery had its way to be fair to them, they would be everywhere, and it's just a matter of churches yeah. being willing to host. And so I want to say that first. If you, yeah. if, you're, if you go to another church and you're listening right now and you don't have a Celebrate Recovery, talk to your pastor, talk to your leadership. Yep. It's yep. awesome. Mm-hmm. We'd love for there to be more so people could go to one every day of the week. But the reality is simply is this. If you're a newly recovering person, one or two meetings a week isn't going to cut it. Yep. And so one of the benefits of, of Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, some of these that have been around for decades, is they're everywhere and all the time. There's almost not a time of day you can't find one of those meetings. And you build a really a, a, a community very quickly. You have a lot of people to choose from to get a mentor, a sponsor. There's just a lot of strength that comes in the numbers and the availability uh, that we just don't have yet with Celebrate Recovery. Yep. Well, and, and I thought it was interesting, too, that a, a friend of mine, uh, I, th- I think you know him, too. Uh, I, I won't say his name here, but he's actually going starting in January. I believe it's a secular uh, uh, program because it's not through the church. But basically, he's he's been in recovery now for about a year, and now he's going through like a leadership program to where he can go around to other places, CRAAs, and just really come you know come to, to help support in different a wide variety of ways to help others. I, I think an important point that you're saying without saying it is that God is not limited by the titles that we give things of Christian or secular. Oh, yeah. That yeah. we don't limit the Lord and his ability to work through all sorts of means. Yeah. We know he talked through a donkey. If he's going to do <laughs> if he's gonna do that, we know he can work through yeah. AA and some of these other programs. And so I would encourage you, of course we love Celebrate Recovery, and we love that we can openly confess our, our love and our, our um, worship for Christ, and that's a place where we can really unpack our faith. But please don't deter somebody from recovery because you think that's not Christian specific enough. Trust God and trust Christ to reach folks. Um, as my sponsor used to tell me, Tom, if you really are seeking the truth, it will avail itself to you. Yeah. And he did. Yeah. And he his name is Jesus. So as we wrap up, is there a, was there anything about... Uh, AA or CR or addictions that uh, maybe a question I didn't bring up. I know I asked you a few questions. Well, one thing you should know is that um, something that secular recovery also does really well, and this kind of brings us full circle in our topic today, is they embrace the LGBTQ plus community really by not differentiating them. Yeah. Um, One of the things that I've noticed in the Christian community and I've had questions about is, you know, Sin is sin. We tend as Christians to make a bigger deal out of homosexuality as a sin. And I believe that's because of fear and because it seems strange to those of us that don't have that issue in our lives. Mm -hmm. And so it's very easy for us to sort of point and push away and treat as different. And what I want to encourage you is if you if you love your neighbor, your friend, your whoever, they're sinners, too. And you don't do that to them. So mm-hmm. I'm just encouraging you, love the LGBTQ plus community the way you love everybody else. Because as Tommy pointed out, we all have fallen short of the glory of God. Yep. Lo- love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, that's Jesus, yeah. Mark yeah. 12. So. so thanks, Tommy. Uh, but as we get ready to wrap up, um, you know, if, if this didn't answer your question or if you have additional questions, you can always reach out to us either on social media. Uh, you can email us directly. So T Gilbert at mynorsa.com or tmory at mynorsa.com. Uh, we would love to have that conversation. But uh, as we get a wrap up, we're reminded that prayer is primary. Uh, Tom, do you mind closing us out? I would love to. Okay. Well, Heavenly Father, um, these are tough topics, um, not for you, for us. And so, Lord, we just ask you to give us wisdom and discernment um, in each and every situation through your Holy Spirit to love people in the way they need to be loved, 
But Lord, always also give us the strength to stand on your truth and your word and to never apologize for standing up for the truth. Lord, thank you for our listeners. Thank you for anybody who's new. Um, we just, uh, we, we feel honored to be able to um, reach people for you in this format. And so, Lord, we would love more questions. Please uh, contact us with more questions. And, Lord, encourage people out there um, uh, just to, to, be, to be your hands and feet and your light and your love to the people and their surroundings. Lord, as we all stumble and don't do that perfectly, um, but we are honored to do that, Lord, and we just ask your help through your Holy Spirit. Thank you. Uh, again, that we get to serve you, that we get to do this podcast together. Thank you for Tommy and all the wisdom that he brings. Um, Lord, just blessings to all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, don't forget, you can catch us every Thursday morning at 7 a.m. to to get this episode or others on Spotify, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, YouTube. And you can also go to mynorshaw.com slash care for additional resources. As always, we love you guys, and we'll catch you next week.